Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman of the Football History Dude Podcast, and I'm stopping by this show real quick to tell you about a couple of cool giveaways that we have going on here at the network. Both are autographed books covering various topics of the NFL. The first is The Point After, How One Resilient Kicker Learned There Is More to Life Than the NFL by ex-NFL kicker Sean Conley. It goes over his unique experience as a walk-on kicker at the University of Pitt after never playing high school football. And then it gets into some of his time playing for NFL teams and so much more beyond the gridiron. The other is from author Kevin Bryant. His book is titled Spies on the Sidelines, the High Stakes World of NFL Espionage. This book started as a curiosity, kind of a passion project to understand everything revolving around well, Spygate. But this put Kevin down a rabbit hole learning about all sorts of espionage that has occurred throughout the history of the NFL. Both permissible <laughs> and often the illicit techniques of gathering intel to try to impact the outcome of the game. To sign up for your chance to win an autographed copy of one of these books, all you gotta do is head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash giveaways and sign up. That's sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash giveaways. Again, check out all the other podcasts that we have in the Sports History Network as well. But now, back to your regularly scheduled journey to the Sports History Timeline. Hey there, Sports History fan. This is Arnie Chapman, aka the Football History Dude, and I'm coming in to you with another FHD Vault episode. Actually, it's going to be more like a three-pack. You see, I'm going to take this week's episode release to recognize what I'm going to call Jim Thorpe Week because on July 15th, 2022, the International Olympic Committee officially reinstated Jim Thorpe as the sole champion of the decathlon and pentathlon in the 1912 Sweden Olympic Games. This was a truly dominant performance and it ended up immortalizing the man that was Jim Thorpe. But then in 1913, his medals were stripped away from him by the Olympic Committee because it was found out that he played a little bit of minor league baseball. There's a whole story there too, and we get into that a little bit in some of the FHD Vault episodes this week. But then in 1982, the IOC did return replica gold medals to the Thorpe family and designated him as co-champion. However, that was not enough because it was really not representative of what really went down back when he had this dominant performance of epic proportions. And this was even before Native Americans were really considered real citizens. Jim Thorpe was considered an American hero and an icon, ultimately later on becoming known as the greatest athlete of the first half of the century. It's a major reason he was chosen as the first president of the NFL. Well, I mean, back then it was the American Professional Football Association, but they were trying to ride on the back of his fame and notoriety from years before. That's where we bring in this FHD Vault episode. Thorpe was one of my first solo episodes for the show. I mean, come on, you walk into the Hall of Fame and you have this monster Jim Thorpe statue just sitting there. So this week, I'm going to release, well, <laughs> re-release a total of three episodes. We have the two solo parts of the Jim Thorpe episode I had, oh geez, way, way back in early, eh, mid-2018. And then we're also going to have the interview that I had with Steve Shankin covering the Indian Carlisle School. But don't just listen to these three episodes, because most, many, somehow, almost every show on the network somehow going to have a Jim Thorpe reference, because he was over many different sports. But off the top of my head, I know that we have Truly the Goats, a dedicated episode. I mean, he started the show with it. Pigskin Dispatch has many different times. Football's Family and so many more of the shows over on the network cover the legendary Jim Thorpe. Enjoy! Before we get started, I wanted to let you know this is the second part of a two-part series on Jim Thorpe's career. If you have not listened to the last episode, which is the first part of the two-part series, I highly recommend you watching that episode first. Now here we go. A horrible tragedy happened on April 15th, 1912. This is the day the Titanic sank to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. The country was devastated by this event. 
their pain was eased at least a little bit in the summer of 1912, due to Jim Thorpe captivating an entire nation with his pentathlon and decathlon gold medals. In this episode, I'm going to tell you how a decision by the International Olympic Committee in 1913 almost derailed the NFL. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Great Scott. This time as we step off our DeLorean, we are back in 1913, about six months after the Stockholm Olympics, where Jim Thorpe just captivated and stole the hearts and imaginations of every man, woman, child in the nation. And we are in America. But the only problem is, this is not one of those moments where we want to write home back to mama. But it is more one of those kind of moments where we want to cry on mama's shoulder. Because our national treasure, our hero Jim Thorpe, ended up getting his medals swiped away by the International Olympic Committee. And the reasoning they had for this was they found out that he was paid to play in minor league games back in 1909 through 1910. So what they did was they just stripped those gold medals away. They said, you ain't getting these. You were paid. And we only want amateurs. Even though Jim Thorpe was being used to play these games. See, it was common practice for a lot of these American Indians back in the day to be able to use their Indian names for, say, Carlisle Indian Football School And then they would go to the minor leagues and they would use like a fake name or vice versa. So Jim Thorpe was arguably unaware of the situation that was going on. However, it did not matter. The Olympic Committee had to make a statement. So they stripped the gold medals away. And we possibly, if the entire nation were to turn on Jim Thorpe, could have been stuck not having the NFL, as we are going to find out later in this episode. But just to kind of ease your minds. His gold medals were restored in 1982. Now, this is well past his death, but at least he still gets credit. However, it's pretty much just his like co-winner, but he will get credit still in the history books for winning those two events. So let's go back to the reason why he lost his gold medals. Like I said, it was because he played some baseball. Jim would end up playing professional baseball in the minor leagues, and of course, he also had to play in the big show, you know. He would play for the New York Giants, and that was kind of his first rendition, his first go-around, and he didn't have a whole lot of luck. They said he couldn't hit the curveball too well, so they kind of sent him back down to the minors. But he would end up returning later to the big show from 1917 to 1919. Of course, this was all the while while he was still playing football, which is the primary bread and butter we're talking about in this show. But in his final Major League year, he had a 327 batting average in 62 games, for New York and Boston. And then in 1920, he played for Akron of the International League, where he had a 320 batting average and 16 home runs. Then a year later, he played for Toledo of the American Association, where he had a 358 batting average for 112 RBIs. Then he would end up retiring a year later from baseball. But now we can finally get to the real reason why you came to this show. We can talk about Jim Thorpe's incredible mark on the game of football. That is, professional football, the NFL, or at least, that's what it would end up becoming. But it wasn't quite the NFL yet. Like I said back in episode 3, when we discussed the founding of the NFL over there in Ralph Hayes' auto dealership, Mr. Hay would use Jim Thorpe as his poster child. The guy that he would hopefully unleash into the world and create a market for professional football. Again. College football reigned supreme at the time. There was no room for professional football. We don't care about a bunch of guys running around and getting paid to do this thing. We want to see the heart and soul. College football, the ranks, you know, the teams. Send my kid off to college and that kind of thing. But really, this is the beginning of what professional football will become. What you and I now know as the NFL. But kind of going back to the beginning of Jim Thorpe's professional football career. It would start there in 1915. An article from the Pro Football Researchers Association said that Jim Thorpe was coaching the running backs at Indiana University when Bill Gardner, 
who was once a teammate at Carlisle, would go to Jim and offer him a contract that he could not refuse. It would be $250 per game, which at the time was just, we've talked about this ludicrous amount for other players, this was just insane. And the contract would be to play for the Canton Bulldogs. So, this is where it all began. And the fans thought that the Canton Bulldogs owner was just crazy. What the heck is Ralph Hay doing? It doesn't make any sense. You know, you're paying $250 for this one dude? 150 bucks more than anybody else? That does not make two licks of peanut butter brickle sense at all. I don't understand. But then, they came to the game. The crowds just showed up in groves. They just flocked the stadiums because they got this guy. Three years previously was, like I said, an international sports superstar. These guys didn't get to see Jim play. In that other episode, I also talked about how I thought that Jim kind of looked like, you know, John Wayne in a football uniform and just kind of reminded me of that bravado and that dude I want to mess with. But now that I've been doing a little more research, I realize I might have been understating the type of player that he was. Like we said, his son in the last episode talked about his father, Jim Thorpe, just dropping the ball, just kick whoever comes my way and just and putting people in hospitals and all sorts of things and all that kind of stuff. And that article said that at this time, he was now six foot one and anywhere between 195 and 205 pounds, but he could just still run like the wind. So he was larger than most linemen at the time, but he was still just as fast, if not faster than everybody else on the field. There's like no comparison. Maybe nowadays, I guess, five, six years ago when Adrian Peterson was in his prime, kind of like that type of dude where when you watched him run, you're trying to figure out, is everybody else on pause or slow-mo or, you know, what's going on here? Because it doesn't make any sense. And that's what it probably was like watching Jim Thorpe just run through dudes. And I could probably pick, you know, there's a plethora of different kind of stories about Jim Thorpe and the different kind of runs that he had and the different kind of spectacular plays and that kind of thing. But there's a story that I kept coming up about Newt Rockney. Yes, Newt Rockney, you know, win one for the Gipper, that kind of guy, who I guess was a popular after-dinner speaker in the 1920s. And he would tell stories about his football career and all that kind of thing. And one of his favorites was when he, you know, managed to tackle Jim for a loss. And he always tells a story like this. After he tackled him, this was the quote from Jim Thorpe. You know you shouldn't do that, Sonny. All these people came to see old Jim run. Then on the next play, Rockney was determined to have even a bigger hit on Jim. Instead, Thorpe lowered his shoulder and leveled Rockney. Then he ended up running for a 40-yard touchdown. And then <laughs> it shows, you know, a picture of Rockney getting all dazed and that kind of thing and being carried off by two people. And Jim ran over to him and said, That's good, Sonny. You let old Jim run. To kind of go along with the whole John Wayne theme, there was a movie called The Searchers back in 1956, where, you know, some kind of altercations and stuff were going on between this one dude and John Wayne, and the guy ends up kind of, I thought a little bit crybaby-ish, goes, I hope you die, or something like that, and he goes, that'll be the day. Kind of along the same lines here, where Jim Thorpe just goes, that's good, sonny, you let old Jim ruin. So I'm not really going to talk about individual games or statistics or anything like that, especially considering official stats didn't even occur until 1934 for the NFL. But as far as skills go, from an individual perspective, now they said maybe Bronco Nagurski could run with more power or Red Grange has more speed or those kind of things. But if you were to put an entire package together of an individual, I don't know if anybody could have ever even touched what Jim Thorpe had. I mean, he had the running skills, the blocking skills, defending, you know, punting, kicking, passing, everything. No one came close to combining all of these into one utility knife of an individual. I mean, he would run with ferocity, he would block with authority, and he made bone jarring tackles. Now, if you out there play Madden, I would say his rating would probably be 100. They're not stopping at 99 like they do. They're just going to go ahead and give him an honorary 100 rating in the Madden game. All of the attributes. Topping out the charts. And to kind of sum this up in the words of a former president, there was a quote from Dwight D. Eisenhower. And it goes as such. As one who played against him in football more than 40 years ago, I personally feel no other athlete possessed his all-around abilities in games and sports. End quote. 
I mean, one of the things that they said he did was, at halftime, he would often demonstrate his kicking prowess, where he would place kick from the 50-yard line one way, and then he would turn around and he would drop kick it for the goalpost the other way. It's just like, come on, man. Just at least pretend like you're not good at this stuff so it makes the other guys feel better about themselves, you know? And that team that he played on, you know, the initial one, the Canton Bulldogs, pre-NFL, he ended up winning the championship in 1916, 1917, and 1919. And he was unparalleled as far as the gate attraction. I was trying to think about nowadays and if there's like an individual that causes people to go to a specific game as opposed to just, you know, the whole team. And it it kind of coincides with what's going on today in the NBA. LeBron James. It doesn't matter where that guy goes. He has fans that basically it's whatever team LeBron's on, that's the team they're a fan of. I don't know if you know this clip from Saturday Night Live where Chris Farley played a guy, a character named Mick Foley. But he's all like, there's you, there's me, there's you, there's me. And then he ended up crashing into this table. It was like, these fans are on. there's LeBron, there's me, there's LeBron, there's me. And now they get to try to figure out where he's going to go next time, you know, the the decision part three. But that was kind of like what it was for Jim Thorpe. He did end up going to various different teams in the NFL, but no matter where he went, he was the draw. He was still this mythical, legendary phantom, kind of, because it's like, like I said before, you don't have TV. You couldn't watch him just on the air. You could listen to the radio. But even then, they weren't broadcasting radio games and stuff like that. You had to read about it in the papers after the fact. We can run your imagination wild about this Minotaur or this... I don't even know if I want to call him Thor or Zeus or... I don't even know what I want to call this guy. What's a god that, you know, better than everybody? I guess that's Zeus, right? He's a king of gods. So that's him. He's Zeus. Dang, I gotta quit calling that other guy Zeus. He is officially now Zeus. And Ralph Hay was like Jimmy Hart for Hulk Hogan. He was this big promoter, you know, his manager. And he recognized that he had the credibility and big name showmanship kind of like Hulk Hogan did. So what he would do is he would invite Jim Thorpe with him on that fateful meeting in his showroom on September 17th of 1920. And the outcome of this meeting, they would name Jim Thorpe as the league's first president. Yes, Jim Thorpe, the Zeus of the NFL. Oh wait, it wasn't called the NFL back then. It was the American Professional Association, which would end up becoming the NFL. But at the time, he was the first president. And the reason, again, was because he had the credibility. And without Jim being the first president and being in this league, it's very possible that we never would have had the NFL. But before we go any further, I wanted to remind you, you can head over to thefootballhistorydude.com slash episode 13 for the show notes. And if you haven't done so, please mash that little subscribe button on your podcast player of choice. That way you get the freshest, hottest off the press episodes each week to your inbox. So getting back to Jim Thorpe's professional career, he would end up playing for six different teams in his pro career, including organizing, coaching, and playing for the Oorang Indians, which was a professional football team comprised of all American Indians. And at halftime, I guess the players would perform different kind of war dances and other rituals to entertain the audiences. But I cannot express enough how important the participation in the NFL that Jim Thorpe was. And he would end up winning many awards that would kind of recognize how much of an impact he had in this sport. But one thing I wanted to point out was he was just an overall just great athlete. One of the things that they mentioned was he was also a great billiards player and he even won a national ballroom championship. So it was like no matter what this guy touched, he was just amazing at. And after his football career was over, he ended up working as an extra and stuntman in movies. And he appeared in more than 60 films between the years of 1931 and 1950. He was even the superintendent of recreation in the Chicago Park System. He would even have stints as a public speaker and lecturer. And he led an all-Indian song and dance trope called the Jim Thorpe Show. Then he would serve as a merchant marine starting at the age of 58. And to kind of commemorate the whole entire life of Jim Thorpe, there was a 1951 movie called Jim Thorpe, All-American. And as I did my research, I found that they're going to have another Jim Thorpe movie coming up, where Martin Sinsmere is going to star as Jim Thorpe. So getting to some of those awards that I was talking about, there is now a Jim Thorpe award that is given out to the most outstanding defensive back in the college ranks. Another award that he got 
was on the all-time NFL team. His nickname is The Legend. Back in 1950, the nation's press selected Thorpe as the most outstanding athlete of the first half of the century. Then, what I consider even more impressive is the ABC's Wide World of Sports awarded him the best athlete of the century. That's the entire 100-year span between the 1900 and 2000 years. And it wasn't Michael Jordan. It was not Babe Ruth. It wasn't Muhammad Ali or any other athlete. They recognized that Jim Thorpe was the most outstanding, best athlete of the entire century. So, of course, he was inducted to the National Football Hall of Fame and Pro Football Hall of Fame inaugural classes. He also would be inducted to the National Indian Hall of Fame, the Pennsylvania Hall of Fame, the National Track and Field Hall of Fame, and I'm sure I'm missing how many more, where, like I said, he was Zeus, and they broke the mold with this guy. If I could go back and take his DNA and recreate a human being to be able to field an army of players in any sport, that's probably going to be the guy. And if you're able to ever go to the Pro Football Hall of Fame, there's going to be a Jim Thorpe statue at the entrance welcoming you, which basically tells it all for me. And to sum up how Jim Thorpe played, I'm going to give you one last quote, and it was from Jim Wood of the Rochester Jeffersons, a guy that Jim had to play against. And it goes as such. Football will never see another Thorpe. The two or more platoon system produces defensive players who don't know how to carry the ball or famous offensive players who don't know how to block or tackle. There's been only one all-time All-American football player, and his name is Jim Thorpe. He blocked with his shoulder, and it felt like he hit you with a 4x4. End quote. Mr. Jim Thorpe passed away on March 28, 1953, at the age of 64, There is no way I was able to give him enough justice by covering everything he did in his career. However, there was a group of people that gave a person about as much of an honor one could ask for. If you start in Philadelphia, and you drive about 85 miles northwest, you will end up in a town with the official name of Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Football History Dude and we're able to gain some knowledge nuggets about the greatest athlete of the 20th century. If you would like to give feedback for the show, please head over to thefootballhistorydude.com slash contact, or hit me up on Twitter. My handle is at FHDude. In the upcoming episode, we're going to talk about the man that overshadowed the meeting of September 17th, 1920. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. Make sure you're the first to get the next episode. Please subscribe with your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. put up my replica 1909 World Series program poster from Row One Brand, and that's all it took for Marla to do a complete redesign of the Guardian offices, doing up the walls with tremendous prints from baseball, football, basketball, hockey, and more sports events. And every one of them can't help but trigger memories of sports yesteryear. And here's the last one. Let's put it up here by your desk. Perfect! Ah, that's a nice one. College football, 1923, Navy versus Penn State. Do you remember that game, Marla? I sure do. It was October 20th, 1923. Cloudy, but a reasonable 57 degrees at the 2.30 kickoff time. Over 20,000 turned out at Beaver Field in College Station, Pennsylvania for this clash of two of the nation's top teams. The Nittany Lions were the underdogs, despite having won their first three games by a combined score of 94 to nothing. The heavy favorites were the midshipmen, who went on to play in the Rose Bowl after the season. Right, and the game immediately became... The entire color of the game would ultimately be dominated by Penn State's star halfback, Harry Wilson. But both offenses took some time to get going for a good 22 minutes before Wilson got the crowd to their feet with an interception of Bill McKee's forward pass, returning it all the way for his first touchdown of the day. 
Wilson certainly was great On the that. next kickoff, who would end up as returner but Harry Wilson? Wilson dodged at least a half dozen Recall the greatest moments in sports history, or just your own personal favorite, with Row 1 brand sports paraphernalia. Don't delay. Visit today at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. That's R-O-W number one today for access to the full Row 1 catalog of gallery prints and gifts like t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, telephone cases, coffee mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Act today for a 15% discount off all prints with coupon code SHN15 and 20% off all other items with coupon code SHN20 at checkout. And keep your dial locked to the Sports History Network for the exciting chronicles of the 1920 sports world in Orville Mulligan. When the gun Sports started right. to mark the end of the game, the score remained Penn State 14, Navy 0. The second half had barely begun when Harry Wilson and Penn State went on to work on Navy again.